aware of our heartbeats fragility so i pray for my creator's will and humility it seems my prayer's weak i can't speak not a linguist does he hear my english when i vent i fear the answer to the question this is symbolic of anguish i feel regarding language and the obligation of revitalizing something sacred failure to carry through is disgrace in a nation my first tongue's in need of a facelift but deciphering conjugations like trying to find my way through a maze in the matrix complex hard to start without an end aside from being fluent i gotta push the limit if i'm gonna keep pursuing so i use it in a way that relates to my life and vocab bring some entertainment to it spit it on a track and i take it out the class can't let what i lack become a self-defeating habit that'll make me want to quit Get your money, do we do cowishin? Jimushka with Zion, me Dutch for me, it is Zion. Me Jishanam, Zagit, he white when Ganu Jishanam. Hello, uh, my name is Lorna Rivera, and I'm a professor of Latino studies and the director of the Gaston Institute for Latino Community Development and Public Policy at UMass Boston. And our institute was founded in 1989 by the state legislature in order to address the needs of uh, the growing uh, diverse Latino community in uh, Massachusetts, which at the time in the 1980s was mostly Puerto Rican and Dominican and Cuban. Um, but we saw a large increase in migration um, from other subgroups of uh, Latinx communities. And really the history then of the Northeast and Massachusetts and Boston's Latinx community is um, very interesting and has you know, lots of different historical, social and economic circumstances that have led to migration from different uh, groups of uh, Latinx communities. Um, but what they do share in common is a history of US imperialism. Um, and that's really what has propelled the social and economic conditions that, for example, have led to more Central Americans uh, coming to, to the Northeast. But um, in the Boston area and in Massachusetts as well, um, the early 20th century migration um, was mostly from Puerto Ricans, the largest group um, that were coming um, to Massachusetts to do seasonal agricultural work. And that was also related to um, uh, policies in, in Puerto Rico, uh, Operation Bootstrap, in particular, that um, forced migration uh, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s uh, to the United States, to North, uh, New England, and specifically to Boston, um, where these early Puerto Rican migrants uh, settled in the south end um, of Boston. Um, there is a great documentary that I recommend called Latino Pioneers in Boston um, that features some of our, our early uh, hit, you know, um, history of migration from um, some Cuban leaders, Puerto Rican and Dominican leaders are featured in this documentary. Um, and their stories also are, are really inspirational and document some of their, 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 that history. Uh, so I do highly recommend it, and, and a shout out to uh, Professor Miren Uriarte, who is one of the founders of the Gaston Institute and is featured in that documentary. Um, I wanted to just highlight um, a little bit about Via Victoria in Boston uh, before I do get into talking a little bit about some of the other demographics of our communities, um, as well as some of the challenges and opportunities facing Latinx communities. But I wanted to just highlight uh, Via Victoria as one of the case studies um, where we really see um, how, you know, in this community by the 1960s um, had um, one of the oldest Puerto Rican um, and largest Puerto Rican settlements. And um, what happened in the story of Via Victoria is that um, the city of Boston was planning to uh, an urban renewal project that would have displaced this um, Puerto Rican neighborhood. And the story of their organizing and their efforts uh, to form a tenants coalition, uh, Inquilinos Boricuas in Acción, a social service agency, um, resulted in this community actually being able to develop that land 
and design it according to the physical and cultural environment of a Puerto Rican barrio. Uh, so you'll see a plaza, small parks, and most importantly, one of the first bilingual preschool programs in the country, La Escuelita Borinquen. Um, and really the story of Via Victoria is also linked to a broader educational justice organizing among Puerto Ricans and other Latinx uh, parents um, that were advocating for language rights and bilingual education in the 1960s. And um, we have some great resources around what Latino parents, primarily mothers, how they were establishing bilingual clusters in the South End, in North Dorchester, and in Roxbury, and in the history of Massachusetts that um, also was the first uh, bilingual education, uh, was the first state to mandate bilingual education in 1971, and the Rafael Hernandez School became the first bilingual school in Massachusetts. So there's some rich history there that, um, you know, I hope that folks can explore. Um, and today, um, we still see um, that Via Victoria, there's a picture up at the top of what the community, how the strength of Port Boston's Puerto Rican community was mobilized in response to um, what happened in Hurricane Maria and also, you know, with uh, the corruption in the island um, and the resignation of the governor. Um, but this resilience of the Latinx communities and of, of Puerto Ricans is just one example, um, but really, um, you know, Latinos um, in Massachusetts, while Puerto Ricans and Dominicans are the largest groups, we have some pretty interesting to the rest of the United States, um, which is what this, um, what this slide shows is comparing our population in the light blue Massachusetts uh, compared to the rest of the country when we think of Latinx communities, it's mostly Mexicans. Um, and what we also see here is um, that Central Americans, if we combine the Central American uh, population, um, you know, Salvadoreños and Colombians, um, Hondurans, um, these um, communities really um, are very large in our area and important to, to understand their unique cultures, languages, and the distinct conditions of their home countries that, that have led them to, to migrate here. Uh, but basically, between 1980 and 2007, our state's Latino population increased by 475%. Um, and many have come to Greater Boston. Um, and um, what we also find is that you know Central Americans if you look at this graph from a report that uh, we have done um, collectively, our institutes on the changing faces of Greater Boston, um, you'll see that what um, is really the case is that those groups that are largest groups, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, um, have tend to have the lowest income, medium household income, and the lowest educational levels despite being here for, for generations. Um, and Central Americans, um, despite having um, you know, poverty rates, uh, they, they, have low, they have lower poverty rates than um, other groups, but still compared to um, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, um, they do have a higher levels of labor force participation. Um, larger household sizes. And so in some ways that these communities, um, you know, tend to fare better than Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. I'm going to skip through um, some of this um, information about the greater changing, the, the changing faces of greater Boston, because I know some of my other colleagues will be discussing some of this data. But I did want to note that in the report, um, I, there is a chapter just on the Latinx communities, and I do focus on the experiences of Colombians in East Boston and Guatemalans in Waltham, if you would like more information. As well, a recent report looks at the challenges and opportunities, a report called Avancemos Ya, um, that I also uh, is available online in a video format to better understand what brought us here, um, our various groups. And what are the challenges? And these challenges, just briefly, I will mention a couple of them, um, have to do with um, the fact that, again, 
high poverty rates um, and low educational attainment is a big issue still affecting uh, the Latinx communities. As well, um, very uh, compared to the rest of the United States and also in Massachusetts, you can see here that Latinos have the highest rates of, of uh, facing uh, food insecurity. Uh, so that is a big issue. As well, um, Latinx communities are also concentrated in seven occupations, occupational segregation that also affects um, you know, the life, the, the well being of our communities. Many of these are, again, in building and grounds, maintenance, construction. And these were many of these essential um, jobs uh, that uh, we saw uh, Latinos were disproportionately affected by COVID because of where they were working. And also, um, when we look at home ownership rates, um, Latinos, um, this is an important issue. Uh, have, they have low home, home ownership, which means they have low uh, generation of wealth. And um, this also affects the social determinants of health, um, where Latinos also have, um, are more likely to lack health insurance, have co comorbidities in terms of obesity, asthma, and diabetes, and also are, are living in, again, household sizes uh, in apartments with um, large uh, population density and um, household sizes of four or more people. And I will wrap up now with just pointing our attention to the fact that as well, when we think about Boston's Latinx communities, um, we're also talking about um, a mix of, you know, um, foreign born and, and second and first generation. But really in Boston public schools, um, what we see is that 57% of our current students uh, live in a household where a language other than English is spoken. Um, and that 49% of BPS students have a first language other than English. And so this matters as well because um, our teachers also are not representative of the fact that 42% 42.5% of the students, um, the public school students in BPS are Latinx, and yet only 10% of our teachers are Latinx. And so um, representation also matters, and that's been an educational justice issue as well, uh, historically in our communities. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, having us think about what are you know, some of the ties again with what happened in Via Victoria with the development of bilingual education, how these experiences of racial and ethnic identity, class and language, um, you know, how did this affect the experiences of Puerto Rican children in the 1960s, but also today, all other Latinx communities um, and what are other social factors um, that affect um, our Latinx students and what can we also learn um, in terms of the, the ethnic studies frameworks about issues around um, hegemony and how hegemony functions, you know, what can we learn from the experiences um, of the development of Via Victoria as well in challenging uh, capitalist priorities and how did Puerto Rican residents um, respond to urban renewal? How did this identification of the issues and, and um, planning and the collective action, how did this all demonstrate uh, solidarity among Latinx communities and other communities as well. And so I um, look forward to um, engaging with you all uh, more uh, deeply around the commonalities that our communities of color share. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this presentation um, by the William Monroe Trotter Institute for the Study of Black Culture and our introduction to uh, the case study on Columbia Point. I'm Michael Johnson. I'm a professor in the Department of Public Policy and Public Affairs in the former Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. I'm co-chair of the Trotter Institute Transition Committee and caretaker of the Trotter while we seek permanent leadership. And um, joining me in this presentation are Professor Denise Patman, College of Education and Human Development, Debbie Fernand, graduate student, Department of Sociology, and Kristen Walks, graduate student, Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'll turn it over to Denise, who will tell us about origins of the African-American community in Boston. Thank you, Michael. 
you know, Boston's revolutionary role in the founding of the United States is a mandatory part of teaching history in our K-12 educational experiences. However, Boston is also home to other revolutionary stories hidden in plain sight. Our case study is but one fraction of this deeply textured, sometimes painful and sometimes joyful story. African-American history begins in Africa where black communities built complex cultures, cosmologies, religions, and scientific educational and eco-political systems for over thousands of years. The Atlantic slave trade violently interrupted African societies as American and European nations captured and brutally enslaved millions of African people in the Americas for capitalist gain and to build this nation. In order to fully appreciate Black Boston, we must start from this basic tenet. As shown in this slide, the Long Wharf Middle Passage Marker is a new installation at the city's Long Wharf and is one of the few UNESCO slave route project markers in the United States. The Boston Middle Passage is situated to look two ways, outward and inward. It honors those African people who died and those who survived the Middle Passage. It addresses the humanitarian issues of the Atlantic Ocean as the burial place of millions of African people brought here enslaved. It is Massachusetts, Wapanoag, and Nipmuc people taken as prisoners of war, also into slavery in the Caribbean. It is the 31 Middle Passage locations in the United States as sites of memory, and it was installed October 2020. This space was not only a site of landing for enslaved African people, but also a site where sea captains and merchants sold people, my ancestors, as if they were mere commodities. Coming from the sea, Resistance to oppression and community development were paramount in the minds of enslaved African people. Boston's deeply rooted Black freedom fighters and our struggle for equity and equality spans the anti-slavery, pan-African, civil rights, Black power, and Black arts movements. Known as the cradle of the abolition, abolitionist movement, the city of Boston's place in the quest for African-American and African diasporic freedom was grounded in the resistance efforts of enslaved Africans who were forcibly taken from their homes, cultures, and societies who survived this middle passage and were brought to Boston since at least 1638. In slide three, you will see from Zipporah Pata Atkins, the 17th century woman of African descent who bought land in Boston in 1670, Crispus Attucks, Phyllis Wheatley, Prince Hall, Thomas Paul, and Susan Paul, and the Black men and men who fought at Bunker Hill, to David Walker and Mariah Stewart, and many, many more, especially those in the 18th and 19th centuries, which this slide shows of our current 21st century uh, sheroes of our former governor, Deval Patrick, honoring one of my shero, Adelaide Cromwell, at our Heritage Guild ceremony to honor Zipporah Par Potter Atkins. These Black freedom fighters continue to conquer and achieve. And now we will focus on the specific shoulders upon which we stand, Mr. William Monroe Trotter. Dr. Johnson? Yes, thank you. So the city of Boston was essential to the fight against slavery before and during the Civil War and the defense of the rights of Black Americans during the post-Civil War era through the 20th century. Central to this struggle was William Monroe Trotter, a radical political thinker, advocate, and journalist. He was born in Chillicothe, Ohio in 1872, raised in the Boston neighborhood of Hyde Park and a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Howard Univers Harvard University. Trotter's lifelong vocation was to, in his words, wage a crusade against lynching, disenfranchisement, peonage, 
public segregation, injustice, and denial of service in public places for people of color in wartime and in peace. He's the namesake of the William Monroe Trotter Institute for the Study of Black Culture here at UMass. Trotter, shown in the second row of this photo, worked with W.B. Du Bois to found the Niagara Movement in 1905 to advocate for Black liberation. Trotter founded the Guardian newspaper in 1901, which advocated for civil rights and organized mass protests. Trotter was a lifelong resident of Boston. The house where he lived his final years is located in Dorchester near Upton's Corner. The William Monroe Trotter Institute for the Study of Black Culture was founded at UMass Boston in 1984 through financial support of the Massachusetts legislature to address the concerns of black communities in Boston and Massachusetts through research, technical assistance, and public service. The Trotter Institute aims uh, to serve as an intellectual hub that can support the mission of social justice for black communities. Its work focuses on mapping the historical and contemporary experiences of Black Boston in its diverse African-American, African, Caribbean, Afro-Latino, Afro-Asian, and Pacific Islander populations. Let's explore just a bit um, some of the many characteristics of Black Boston. Over the past 30 years, we see that the Black population of the city of Boston has increased by over 34,000, and the Black population of Boston metropolitan areas increased by even more, by almost 151,000. The city of Boston increases in the Latino and Asian populations particularly have resulted in the share of Boston's population that is black decreasing slightly. A major trend in our region has been an increase in the number of foreign born and non black residents. Um, I acknowledge um, and recognize the diverse roots of our black community from Caribbean islands such as Trinidad, Jamaica, Haiti, Dominic, uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, many African countries, including Cape Verde, Kenya and Nigeria. Um, we see that for the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston, the percentage of population that's black has decreased over time, while the city of Brockton, south of Boston, has seen its black population increase substantially. In both communities, foreign born blacks are a large component of the total black population. These trends of increased black population that is foreign born and living outside of Boston holds true for the metropolitan area as well. Population shifts across neighborhoods have greatly affected black Boston. This map shows increases in white population, the red shaded areas, in some traditionally black communities. These are indications of gentrification, one effect of which has been black residents moving to more affordable areas outside the city, such as Brockton. A long history of systemic barriers to opportunities such as redlining, residential segregation, and unequal educational access has resulted in stark differences in economic and social opportunity between Black Bostonians and the larger population. On the left-hand side, we see that the median income for Black residents in Greater Boston is just 58% of the area-wide median income, while the Black home ownership rate is less than half of the overall rate. The study by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston in 2015 computed the difference between assets and debts across various groups and concluded that while the net worth of white households was almost $250,000, the net worth of US born black families was close to zero. The numbers were only slightly better for immigrant black families and Latino communities. At this point, I'll turn it to an introduction to our case study, um, Professor Padman. I will actually be taking the lead on that. Thank you, Michael. And now I'm going to transition us to provide a bit more context to the setting and design of our case study. And so to orient us, in 1954, the Columbia Point Peninsula became the site of the Columbia Point Housing Project, the largest of its kind in New England at that time. From its inception, the racially mixed housing project was in isolation, surrounded by open fields, the landfill, and water, Columbia Point opened without a grocery store, shops, a bank, school, church, healthcare, or public transportation. What the peninsula lacked in terms of services, the residents, in particular the Mother's Club, played an important role in securing. Next slide, please. The purpose of this case study is to tell the stories of the unsung African-American sheroes and heroes who work tirelessly to provide equitable services to their low-income families living in the Columbia Point housing projects throughout the 1960s and 70s. 
This is evidenced through the efforts of Black community members who demanded public safety, educational resources, and quality housing. Mothers went to City Hall demanding more police protection, as imaged in the photo on the top left-hand corners. Families went to the Boston Housing Authority to protest the Housing Authority's aggressive neglect of the Columbia Point Housing Project, as seen in the top photograph on the right. Residents also demanded the creation of preschool and after-school programs that provided the quality of inclusion education Black and Brown children deserved and needed, and which was not taught in public schools. Our case study comprises a melange of Black voice in newspapers, television programs, petitions, amongst other primary and secondary sources. Here, we situate the teacher as inquirer. Our case study encourages students and teachers to conduct rigorous inquiry-based exploration and study concerning the questions that arise from thinking critically about what history tells us, how that knowledge impacts questions and solutions we have about our present in order to create positive possibilities for the future concerning Black community development in the city of Boston. In short, this work respects the teacher and student as thinker, scholar, and generator of knowledge based on the materials of our case study. And now I will transition back over to Dr. Patman, who will begin a discussion about what brought each of us to the case study. Thank you very, very much, uh, Christian. So there, in the interest of time, really quickly, there were three things that motivated me to join this research team to create this case study. First of all, I lived in Boston at the time when Columbia Point was notorious. It shared space with the newly constructed UMass Boston. And I was curious about how the university would interface with low-income Black residents. What type of interdependence could there be on what was previously the city dump? Second of all, gentrification is happening everywhere, even today. But I was particularly interested in the dramatic change from Columbia Point to Harbor Point and what will emerge into the city within the city of Boston with big plans charted for this area for the future. So the story of white families who lived in Columbia Point were well documented, but the African-American stories would be lost, stolen and or strayed if they were not documented with dignity. And finally, and most importantly, as for me, this photo that you see in uh, this uh, slide, I was drawn to this project because I wanted to highlight the strengths of Black mothers and their ability to advocate and organize for their children and families. The dominant narrative at that time painted a picture of women, of Black women, as being ignorant, unrefined, and welfare queens. I knew that this was untrue. I knew that I had to, and many, many other women, uh, Black mothers in particular, had to chart different routes to dignity. So it would be a privilege for me to capture some of their stories. Black women, and um, in this uh, photo, uh, uh, are members of the SMART set who held a conclave here in Boston in 1966 at the Buckminster Hotel. Um, to support the interests of Black families, in particular, the needs of students, of children. Now we'll turn to Christian to get some of his thoughts about why it was important for him to do this research. Absolutely. And so first and foremost, what brought me to this case study is my life story, being born in Dorchester, being an undergraduate student at UMass Boston, but not hearing much about the Columbia Point neighborhood. Even though I had friends who grew up there, there were these sort of negative associations and not many positive stories about the community. And so as a scholar training in the field of Black studies, I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to reverse that scripts of pathology and look at this community from its strength. And boy, has it been a beautiful time learning the strengths of this community, the mothers, the families, the children, and so that is what brought me to this uh, case study, learning more about where I come from and where I have been to think about where I would like to go in the future. 
and I'll pass it over to Debbie Ferdinand. Thank you, Christian. So um, when I was initially called to this project, I did some initial reading on the work of William Monroe Trotter, an advocate for change and a vessel for the voices of Black Boston at the time. While reading sources on Columbia Point, I came across a small fragment of information that has stuck with me since, um, that the Columbia Point community uplifted themselves through means of grassroots organizing before this term was even conceptualized. Learning the history of Black activism within the context of their own communities allows students to see themselves within past community leaders and empower a new generation of future Black leaders, activists, and change makers. And I will pass it over to Michael. Thanks. What's particularly compelling for me about Columbia Point is that it represents all of America's ambitions and contradictions and successes and failures regarding social housing decent, affordable housing available to all. So on this slide, I show images of Columbia Point on the right and the Columbia Public, uh, the Chicago Public Housing Community of Cabrini Green on the, on the right. And I think both cases illustrate that Black people were never really part of the social contract that produced public housing in the early and middle 20th century and became associated with institutional failures of public housing in the late 20th century. In many cities, public housing was demolished to be replaced by mixed income housing that provided limited opportunities for former public housing residents and represented what I view as black cultural erasure. How can we tell the story about vibrant communities whose residents organized to provide opportunities um, for their children? So we'll close it now with uh, some very brief uh, takeaways um, from uh, each of our team members, um, Denise. Thank you. Quickly, I'm hoping that students and teachers understand that there is no one monolithic Black Boston community in contemporary times. The purpose of this case study was to recognize the giants who were devoted to community development upon whose shoulders we stand today. Secondly, I hope that um, if to better understand where this community stands today, we must look at the experiences of Black Bostonians in the past through this particular lens of Columbia Point circa 1960s and 70s. We provide the world views, day-to-day -day experiences, and struggles that made up the Columbia Point urban housing project landscape from a Black strength-based perspective. And finally, there is a deep connection between current day practices of humiliation and rejection of black and brown people at the US borders, which we see and experience now to those experienced in the 1960s and 70s. I hope to inspire students to think about what it means to be a contributing citizen in the future. What does citizen activism mean to you? What are the experiences of your people in this country and what counter narratives need to be documented. I will now turn to Chris. Thank you, Dr. Patman. And briefly, I'll add, I would like for students and teachers to understand that Black history is every day, as ongoing in terms of time, but also in terms of the everyday local figures advocating for change in order for students to see themselves as part of this wonderful legacy. And I will transition over to Debbie. What I hope that students take away um, from this project is the, lar that the larger social movements that we're seeing currently in the media begin within our own communities. As students, we are often not taught in schools the historical significance of Black must be taught more of the Black advocates who have paved the way for Black liberation, um, individuals who started within their own neighborhoods. What students and teachers will come to understand is that throughout history, and especially within the context of Black Boston, there have always been radical Black women or radical women engaged in mobilization, organizing, and leadership. We know that this is not new. And I will turn it over to Michael. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. Uh, I, I want students and teachers to understand that strong, vibrant, resilient Black communities can thrive anywhere, at any time, with the power of individuals who fight for their own dignity and human rights, 
and with the power of government that puts into practice the belief that decent and affordable housing in healthy and opportunity rich communities is a human right. Thank you very much. Thank you to our students, researchers, thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Paul Watanabe. I'm the director of the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston and a professor in the Department of Political Science at the same institution. I'm really happy to bring this presentation today on the Asian American community in Boston and the U.S. and something about the background of this population, which I think is the least known about than any other major racial group in the United States. Let me begin, for example, by this first uh, portrait, this picture, which may be familiar to many of you school uh, students. It's one of the few activities that Asian Americans participated in that sometimes studied in our history books. And this is the point at which the Transcontinental Railroad, the linking of the country from east to west by rail, was celebrated. The, the joining of the rails from east to west was, was, was celebrated in a place called Promontory Point, Utah, which is about 40 or 50 miles north of where I was born in Utah several decades ago, I must say. And at this moment, this triumphant moment, which took place in 1869, this is the joining of the two railroads from east to west, triumphal moment. And here's a picture with dozens of men in it. And there's something interesting about this picture, however. At this triumphant moment, there's dozens of men in this picture, and there is hardly any. There may just be one person of Chinese descent in this entire picture. There's and people have gone over this picture with even a with a microscope to try to find who's in the picture. And the fact that there is hardly any Asian Americans or Chinese Americans in this picture might seem to be an odd question. Why is it important? And the reason it's why it's important is the people who actually built the railroad, the people who didn't finance it, like the Leland Stanford's of the of the Stanford University fame, but the people who actually built the railroad were people of Chinese descent, particularly in the most difficult parts of that building, that railroad, from west to east across the Sierra Nevada mountains and the rugged mountains of the Sierra Nevadas and the deserts of Nevada and Utah. And that very difficult task of actually building the railroad was undertaken on the, on the side of those who came from the west to the east almost 80, 90% of the, of the laborers provided by Chinese laborers who actually did the hard work of building the railroad. And yet at this moment of triumph, this moment of success, they are absent from the picture. They're not included. They're erased from this picture of this triumphant moment in which they participated so hard to bring it, to bring it about. This erasure and this, and this invisibility is something that is, is measured as well by the next picture. And that is, this is a, a, a the cover of a book called The Uprooted, as you see the epic story of the great migrations that made the American people. In this, The Uprooted, the epic story of the great migrations that made the, the American people. This is a standard, uh, in some, some cases, considered definitive history of the United States' uh, effort to be uh, a, a, a nation of, of immigrants, of the immigration and the, and, the, and the development of the United States through immigration. It was written by Oscar Hanlon, a Harvard University pre professor who, as you see, won the Pulitzer Prize in history for this book. In this so-called definitive account of the immigration history of the United States, particularly in the early editions of this book, and it still is a book that is still published and still being studied and used as a, as a standard text in immigration history, there was not a single word of anybody who came across, not across the Atlantic to figuratively to uh, Ellis Island in New York Harbor, but anybody who came across the Pacific, across the, the vast reaches of the Pacific and came through San Francisco and Angel Island and San Francisco Harbor. Not a single word about anybody other than the European immigration uh, in this epic story, the great migrations that made the American people. It's partly because of this, of this invisibility of those who came across the other ocean, across the Pacific, rather than the Atlantic, that the, a professor from uh, University of California, Book, Berkeley, named Ronald Takaki, he wrote the first real history of Asian Americans coming to the United States as immigrants. And he titled his, his book, A History of Asian Americans, and he titled it Strangers from a Different Shore. And those the titles, Strangers from a Different Shore. 
Asian, Asian Americans were strangers to the American experiment, strangers to the American story, and strangers to the American public when he wrote this book. He was trying to introduce these strangers who came across the Pacific and not across the Atlantic to the American population. They were largely unknown and largely invisible people in the United States. And they were strangers despite the fact that for over 200 years they have been in the United States. In Boston's Chinatown, they have been here approximately 150 years, largely in the same location. In the South Station location in Boston, there's been a Chinatown for almost 150 years. It's been a period of time, however, this particular Chinatown in Boston is one of the oldest and functioning Chinatowns. That is Chinatown where people live and call home. It's not just restaurants, it's not just businesses, it's a home where pe people raise their families and it's a neighborhood within Boston, perhaps even the densest in terms of population of any city with it, of, of any sector section with, of Boston itself. And yet, in some respects, it has suffered from all kinds of attempts at expanding into the area, from institutional expansion, the building of, of, of highways and of large institutional entities like the, the uh, med medical centers, and even the, the imposition of things like the combat zone within this particular neighborhood, which was easy to do if you didn't see that there were people who actually lived in the neighborhood. The, the people who lived there were invisible it was easy to do, but in some respects, that's what people saw. They didn't see beyond the facades and beyond the, the businesses and beyond the storefronts. They didn't see that behind them were people who called this home who lived in there. And it was a neighborhood that they lived and raised their families in. And thus, they have suffered over the years from these impacts of trying to impose these various, these, these various institutional uh, uh, impediments on this particular neighborhood. And it's been a forever struggle, as Michael Liu writes in his most recent book, on the struggle of people in Chinatown to try to maintain their, their dignity and their home in Chinatown over the decades. It's been a forever struggle by these people to try to convince people that this is a neighborhood that needs to be respected as though it were any other neighborhood within the city and the struggle to do so. Today, there are approximately 24 million Americans in the United States who trace their descent to Asia, and over 500,000 in Massachusetts alone. They represent about a little over, now about 7% of the population of Massachusetts, and Boston has about 75,000 people of Asian descent. About 12%, 11% or 2% of the city's population is now Asian American in terms of background. The Asian Americans are, in fact, the fastest growing racial group in the United States and in Massachusetts, with over a tenfold increase since 1960 in the size of this population. They doubled in each decade for several of, of those uh, decades after 1960, and most recent decades had about a 50% increase from, the, from 2010 to 2020, and so it's a large and fast growing population. Is a, is a population fed largely by immigration. As you see, Asian Americans by far are the largest immigrant population in the United States, in, in Massachusetts and the United States. As you see here, Asian Americans are about, what is this, about uh, 60, 65% of Asian Americans are foreign born. That is to say that, no, it's actually uh, almost 70% of Asian Americans are foreign born with about 35.5% uh, of those who are Asian Americans not citizens yet, and about 32.8% of them immigrants who are naturalized citizens, about 31% are US born citizens. So about 68% of the population is foreign born, it's immigrant. It's the largest immigrant population in the United States. And will soon, in, in the Boston area, it will soon become the largest in the United States itself. So immigration is a way to uh, define this population and its growth. And it is also a population that represents great diversity and complexity. It's not a monolithic model minority by any means. There are nearly 20 Asian American ethnic groups, for example, subgroups in Massachusetts, tracing their ancestry to China, for example, which is the largest group in, the, in Boston. And the second largest is Asian Indian population, followed by Vietnamese, Cambodian, Koreans, Filipinos and Japanese. But you see that even there, even at the bottom, of, there are about a thousand Bhutanese in the United States and about 20 Asian subgroups, ethnic groups in the United States with a thousand or more population. Tremendous diversity in this population. There is no singular Asian American community. 
or group in the United States that they represent various different sorts of segregated subgroups, disaggregated subgroups of individuals from various different Asian countries. And that's a very important thing to recognize. They are no singular Asian American group, but they are understood in terms of having a variety of Asian ethnic groups and it adds to the complexity and diversity within this population. In, on top of this uh, ethnic diversity, there is great socioeconomic diversity and complexity for the population as well. In income and educational attainment terms, there is tremendous diversity. There is a population that has very high levels of educational attainment, some of the highest of any groups within the Boston area. And yet we have some of the highest poverty rates of any groups within the Boston area. And we see this represented in various ways, dependent upon what particular communities we're looking at. And therefore, if we disaggregate this large body of Asian American uh, population and statistics on it, we see that in fact, there's huge diversity in terms of things like educational attainment and income and poverty rates, et cetera. And this is well depicted by the, this next slide, which is, a, it's a, a way to show, for example, about the tremendous diversity that exists within the Boston Asian American community. On one, on one uh, 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 axis, you have the income of the various groups. On the other axis, you have the notion of, uh, what, of educational attainment. This time, the share of, share of groups that have bachelor's degrees within the, within the, the, uh, the, the group. And so you see, if you're high to the right on both scores, you have high incomes and high educational attainment. And you see the Indian community is represented at that particular end of the spectrum, high levels of, of, of economic attainment, high levels of education. And you see Taiwanese and Japanese and others up in that right-hand corner. In the lower left-hand corner, however, you see Cambodians and Vietnamese, for example who have low levels of economic attainment and low levels of education. So you see the difference that exists within this population between those up to the to high to the right and those down to the left. And in the middle, you see the Chinese, which represents the largest ball. So they're the largest population in, in, the, in the area. And you see them occupying this place in the middle, which indicates that they are in some ways a bimodal population. They have high levels of education, high levels of educational attainment and, and income attainment, and low levels of educational attainment and thus low levels of income. And they sort of sit right in the middle. In some ways, they, they are represented in terms of the diversity of economic and educational attainment is represented by the Chinese. So this shows a tremendous diversity that exists even within the educational attainment and 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 uh, and income within the population. There is a, a mythology in some respects that Asian Americans are like this model minority, consistently having across the board having high educational attainment and high levels of income and occupational uh, accomplishment. That's not the case. It is a community that represents that in certain sectors and other sectors less so. And in turn, to understand the dynamic of the community, you have to disaggregate the data often along the Asian ethnic uh, group lines understand that reality. Now, the question is, what are the consequences of this invisibility? What are the consequences of not being seen about being in some ways erased? And when history and experience is seen through a, a narrow lens, that is, if one looks at the, the to them through this narrow lens of invisibility, a group is easily marginalized, it's, there's easily to be prejudiced, it's a particularly vulnerable group. And subject to stereotypes and inappropriate racializations by those who are in the dynamic, who are in the position of being the dominant structures, power structures within the country, which tends to be tradition in American experience, the white experience in terms of white supremacy, in terms of defining the ways in which various communities of color are perceived. The racial meanings that are assigned to various groups of color in the United States have a significant impact on their well being. For Asian Americans, I think there have been two dominant, in some ways seemingly different poles apart sort of conceptions of Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners or as a model minority. A model minority, which I want to only discuss briefly here, is the notion that Asian Americans are all successful, that they don't re represent any of the, they, few of the sort of the pathologies that are often associated with, with communities of color in the United States, et cetera. And this notion that Asian Americans are in some ways perceived as a counterweight to some other groups are perceived as more problematic in these realms. That notion is a uh, model minority is really referred to by us traditionally as the myth of the model minority because it's not true. It's not true in terms of the substance of it, 
given the fact that when you disaggregate the group along lines I've talked about, the levels of attainment are not as high as those that are represented by the model minority myth. And secondly, the myth is not one that is used in some ways to valorize or really uplift Asian Americans. It really is a purpose to triangulate and be used as a way to discipline Blacks and other groups, particularly when the model minority myth emerged in the 1960s. It was a way to say that in a country in which the Blacks were making demands on the country in a large way in the 1960s through the Civil Rights Revolution, that instead of the society itself, the dominant structure within the society said, yes, race is a factor, and there is such thing as structural institutional racism. It created this notion, this myth in some respects about Asian Americans as a non-white group who are not showing the pathologies and so forth allegedly demonstrated by other groups and not complaining and so forth. And therefore, it could not be structural racism against communities of color. It must be the communities of color themselves who are responsible for their plight. In this case, the notion that Blacks are responsible for all of the inequities and, and, and racism that was felt upon them and not a structural institutional basis for it. And, and that's how the model minority mythology was used against them to discipline Blacks and other groups in the United States. The second conception, and one that's particularly important given the per current reality and the ongoing reality of Asian American racism that we're seeing a rise of recently since the COVID-19 period is the notion of Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners. And this notion is, is called by uh, Angel and Chetta as outsider racialization. Asian Americans are perpetually perceived, no matter how long they may have been here in this country or their ancestors have been here in this country, as perpetual foreigners, as tied to the country from which our ancestors came from much more than here in the United States, so that their loyalty can be questioned, their ability to assimilate and function effectively in American society can be a question. It's easily as a basis to use as a policy basis to exclude and not include them in the whole perception of what it truly is to be an American nation made up of immigrants from all places around the world. And we see that this notion of perpetual foreignness is used to exclude and now to discipline not, not Blacks and others, but Asian Americans themselves. It says to Asian Americans, no matter how successful you think you might have been or how long you have been here, in some ways you are reduced to being a foreigner and your connections and your loyalties are principally perceived as foreign. And thus actions like were taken historical manifestations are the fact that Asian Americans in policy terms were uniquely provided as an alien category called aliens ineligible for citizenship. That is, Asian Americans uniquely and, and, and non-free Blacks up until the time, uh, and, and Blacks who immigrated to the United States as free, free Blacks in the early stages of the country were placed in a unique situation being called aliens ineligible for citizenship. They were aliens sent to the United States, they could come to the United States, but could not become citizens. And that is a fundamentally opposed to the fundamental notion of how this nation was populated. The notion of the United States is, is a nation that is open to anybody who wishes to come from anywhere through the world and can come here and, and, and become a naturalized citizen in the United States and call America home. That fundamental notion was one that was, was not applied to Asian Americans. And even after free, Blacks were given the ability to become citizens after becoming naturalized after the Civil War, amendments. Asian Americans were uniquely now placed in a position to be, can continue to be aliens ineligible for citizenship. And so that particular reality existed for Asian Americans, for people like myself, for Asian Americans from Japan, for example. That reality continued almost until the early 1950s, when finally Asian Americans who came to the United States as immigrants could become American citizens. But of course, the other historical manifestations are in terms of exclusion acts that the first time in 1882, the United States said to a group of people, you cannot come to the United States because of your race or the nation from which you're coming from. That was the very first time. So this, for the first time, the United States invited a category of people called undocumented or illegal immigrants. Up to that time, the conception was that there was no such thing as an undocumented or illegal immigrant in the sense that you could not be illegal coming from anywhere to the United States because from anywhere in the world you could come to the United States. But after the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, for the first time we told said a group of people cannot come to the United States. And they happen to be a non-white group of people from, from, from Asia, in this case, China, who could not come to the United States. So it was the very first time we placed a limitation on the right of people to come to the United States from, from, from the country from where they came or because of their race. <clears throat> 
And that whole conception of exclusion was a very important point. And that ultimately the notion of restricting immigration to the United States continued for all Asians ultimately. So that by 1924, essentially all immigration to the United States was halted from any Asian country to the United States was halted. And that was not really restored until in some significant way, that structure was not changed really in a, in a fundamental way for many Asian Americans until World War II and to the 1940s and 1950s. And in a fundamental way, the, pro the program was not changed effectively until 1965 when the 1924 Immigration Act, which is really the one that's helped define American immigration policy for the next 40 years was replaced by the 1965 Immigration Act. So in some respects, Asian Americans were prevented from coming to the United States effectively in very large numbers for a significant period of time. They were excluded as a matter of course. And then of course, the World War II Japanese American incarceration of Japanese Americans was fundamentally one that perpetuated this notion of Asian Americans as perpetual enemies, as perpetual foreigners. The notion that Japanese Americans, no matter your status as citizens or not, or whether you're young or old, have ever been to Japan or not, were in some ways tied to Japan as a security threat and therefore subject to being removed from people's homes and thrown in America's concentration camps for several years in many cases was the basis for the, for the, for the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And this notion about perpetual foreignness is very much a part of subsequent events like the Vincent Chin, Chin the killing of Vincent Chin in the early 1980s, or treatment of Wen Ho Lee, who was an American a, a scientist who was treated as though he were a spy for China just because, again, of his, of his Chinese descent. Or the treatment of Asian Amer South Asian Americans after 9-11, or the COVID-19 reality, which we're claiming now, where Asian Americans are being blamed for by the president of the United States and other people for being the ones who perpetuated and were responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. All of those sorts of elements are part of this perpetual foreign notion, the notion that Asian Americans are responsible for what happens far away, even though they're here in the United States and have no real connection to what happened there. And we see this as well in terms of the Atlanta and shootings and those that took place in Indianapolis as well. And some of the recent attacks have been taking place on Asian Americans, not only in terms of murders, but in terms of various sorts of actions against anti-Asian racism, microaggressions, attacks, bullying, et cetera, that have taken place against Asian Americans are, are a manifestation of this. Hello, I'm Cedric Woods, Director for the Institute for New England Native American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I'm also a citizen of the Lundy Indian Tribe of North Carolina, Flycower University, UMass Boston. I am also a resident in the homelands and the home waters of the Massachusetts Tribe of Ponkapog, who are very much a current partner with us in the work that we do, as well as other indigenous communities in Boston, both from local native communities and elsewhere. My presentation today is setting the framework in relation to indigenous presence and resilience in the city of Boston, as well as threats to its well health and well-being, which are directly tied to the case study, which you will be engaging with later. Uh, before we go anywhere, I think we have to situate where we are at. Uh, as you look at the map on my left, probably your right, you can see the city of Boston and its presence in Massachusetts territory. You can very much see the better known Wampanoag south of there uh, and where I'm coming to you today from in Plymouth. Uh, and we also see to the west of Boston, the homelands of the Nipmuc, Narragansett, Pequot, Mohegan, uh, and many other indigenous nations of this place. I make this point because there were many native peoples here then, uh, and those native peoples are still here now. Uh, and what also has occurred, uh, if you look at the data from the 2010 census and 2016 American Community Survey, you will see that it is increasingly diverse in terms of indigenous representation. We still have Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and other native peoples from this place. We also have Cherokee indigenous peoples from South America, like Quechua, 
uh, Tragui, who identify as indigenous, as well as thousands of Mi'kmaq and other Wabanaki people here from the Canadian Maritimes and the state of Maine. We also have tens of thousands of indigenous peoples in what is now the Commonwealth from across Turtle Island, like myself and my wife. I am Lumbee, she's Turtle Mountain Chippewa. We live in the Boston neighborhood of Mattapan. Indigenous presence, indigenous diversity, very much grounds the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and very much situates the city of Boston. Boston as the largest urban area in the Commonwealth is the largest city. It is also home to the largest population of American Indians. If you don't take anything away from this presentation today, other than this, then it's been worthwhile. I want you to assume indigenous history, both deep history and current history, everywhere you look in our region. Whether we're talking about Deer Island in Winthrop, which was an internment ground during King Philip's War or Metacom's Rebellion for about a thousand Nipmuc people, most of whom never left that island. Whether we are looking at the beautiful cliffs at Aquinnah uh, called the Gay Head due to its bright colors tied to deep traditional stories of that place, or whether we are looking at Spain Street in Natick, named after one of the native proprietors in that place when it was the Praying Town and later Indian District of Natick, or whether we are in the Blue Hills looking downtown to Boston, uh, the heart of Massachusetts country, which had served as a quarry and the source of stone for indigenous peoples for millennia before sustained contact with Europeans. It's all Indian country. Also, I want to reiterate the deep diversity of our indigenous communities. We have Mexica or Aztec people in the city of Boston, in the Commonwealth, and we do not live in isolation from one another. Indigenous peoples connect, this particular Mashika dancer is at the Mashpee Pow Wow, but they also participate and directly engage at other cultural festivals as well. Very much part of the diverse mosaic and rich fabric of indigeneity when we talk about the city of Boston. In spite of our richness of indigenous presence, indigenous peoples, we face threats. Some of these threats are directly tied to our youngest and most vulnerable members, our children. And these threats are absolutely linked to celebration and commemoration of individuals like Christopher Columbus who start the Indian slave trade. That's something that frequently is not discussed in the conversations and the lesson plans around the Trans-Columbian Exchange, uh, movement of peoples and goods back and forth across the Americas. Many of those peoples, including on all of his voyage, were enslaved indigenous peoples from the Americas that ended up in Spain, across Europe, in the Caribbean and other places where they were exploited. Uh, and again, the history of the recognition of Christopher Columbus is very much tied to marginalization of another community, Italian Americans in particular. Uh, but in spite of that marginalization of Italian Americans, recognition of someone like Christopher Columbus doesn't take away from that. Rather, it erases or marginalizes safety, health of indigenous communities here in Boston. Uh, the statue that you'll see uh, at one point was painted, covered in red paint in 2015 and more recently decapitated. Uh, and it is no longer going to be at Columbus Park in Boston. Uh, and these are some points in relation to that, that occurred in 2020. Uh, and it will reside elsewhere. And so now there is a conversation, a dialogue uh, between the various communities, partners, stakeholders, whichever term you choose, 
uh, as to what should be in that place next. Uh, the page is turning, uh, but again, recognition and celebration of individuals like Columbus undercut resiliency, indigenous peoples feeling valued and represented here. Also in the city of Boston, something which has not occurred statewide yet, but Mayor Janey signed an executive order declaring the second Monday of October to be Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Boston. Our newly elected Mayor Wu has continued that commitment. And again, this is something that has been done in partnership and in collaboration with local Indigenous communities, both those from this land like Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc peoples, and our rich indigenous mix here as well, whether it is people from the Northern Plains, from the Southeast, like myself, uh, and also indigenous representation from the Caribbean. The other challenge that our children, our most valuable community members, and also most vulnerable community members deal with uh, is the ongoing plague of native mascots in the Commonwealth. I think at this point in time, there are around 30 schools that still use, in many cases, clearly racist, defensive mascots and caricatures of indigenous peoples. Uh, and you may ask, well, what's wrong with these? Aren't they giving honor to native peoples? Absolutely not. Uh, when they come to be, uh, when they become entrenched in American society, uh, it is very much at the closing of the frontier when the Indian problem is being viewed as resolved and indigenous peoples are being replaced with the new indigenous communities, i.e. Anglo-Americans. Uh, they also emphasize negative racial stereotypes, native people as warlike, native people as wearing headdresses, uh, which in some places they do, but absolutely not in these Eastern Woodlands area. Uh, and the social science data is very clear. It does harm to native and non-native children alike. Native children do less well in school where these offensive mascots exist. Uh, it negatively impacts their self-esteem and it reinforces negative stereotypes and caricature among non-native students. You may be thinking here in the city of Boston, well, we don't have any schools that use these mascots, but our sports teams absolutely play teams from these towns that still embrace caricature, erasure, and negative stereotyping of indigenous peoples. Uh, and that brings me to another example of uh, an effort and process to freeze native peoples in time to freeze native peoples in specific in the past, and that is via the state seal. Frequently as a faculty member at UMass Boston, I will have indigenous visitors to campus from around Turtle Island. And if they catch a glimpse of the state seal, one of the first questions they ask is Cedric, what's up with the Indian about to get decapitated? Uh, and I fully understand that in the conventions of heraldry, those items are unrelated, but let's take a step back and look at what the items are that are connected to one another. Uh, the proportions of the native man on the seal are the result of a grave robbery in Wendler. Uh, so the proportions of the arms, legs, the height are based on a native man that was disinterred his grave was pillaged and looted. And so that's what they use for the proportions. The bow that native man is holding is based on the Sudbury bow, which was taken from a native man killed in the 17th century in Sudbury. The sash the native man is wearing is probably taken from a dead native warrior in Lovell's War in Maine in the early 18th century. And last but not least, local indigenous peoples have been replaced by using the face of a Chippewa chief, Chief Little Shell from Montana. Uh, 
So every way you can think of it, a local indigenous people presence in history have been erased and replaced by utilization of the seal. And even though it is not intended, uh, it absolutely to me and to any native person that looks at it, looks like that sword of Miles Standish, which it is indeed based on, who was involved in the West Augusset massacre, is ready to decapitate Chief Little Shell. So when we look at these challenges, we think of these threats, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the indigenous response to provide better protection for native youth, for native communities? Uh, this has played out at a couple of different levels here in the city, uh, under Mayor Janey, under Mayor Wu, uh, there is now a actual consultant that's been hired to look at indigenous public representation in cultural spaces. Uh, the, they're in the process now of hiring a supporting indigenous communities fellow, which will be part of the mayor's office of new urban mechanics. And last but not least, criticality of affirming local history of affirming ongoing native presence and resilience of the Massachusetts people. Uh, the Landmarks Commission is in the process of landmarking the Massachusetts native rhyolite quarry site in Mattapan. Uh, and this will be the first Native American historical landmark. So some progress is happening, at least here locally. Uh, what has not yet happened uh, is addressing these issues on the state level. Uh, and this brings us to several items in terms of addressing not just mascots, not just Columbus Day, but also engaging with proper curriculum as it relates to Native peoples. The statewide elimination of Native mascots and, of course, addressing the state seal. That is part of the Massachusetts statewide legislative agenda. Uh, and there is ongoing work uh, and pressure by both Native as well as non-Native allies to address. Why are we doing this? We want to create the safest, healthiest health promoting spaces in the city of Boston and in the Commonwealth for indigenous peoples. Thank you for your time. Thanks everyone so much for coming together and giving the presentations that you did. I think there was so much to be learned about each of the communities. Um, and one thing that we're trying to do in this space right now is to have a conversation together about across communities. Um, what does that look like in Boston? Um, so I wanted to highlight a few things and ask a few questions and I'm hoping the format will be less of a, a panel you talking to me than, uh, than rather you talking to each other um, across uh, institutes. So I think that you know what's exciting about having worked with UMass Boston and the Kanala Institute is that there is such a thing as a Kanala Institute, right? There is, it's, um, there is a group of folks who are sort of together um, dealing with these questions across um, issues in Boston. And I think when you're talking about race and ethnic studies, often um, you know, there is this risk of sort of this ethnocentric siloed way of talking about each of the communities, um, which um, you know, I think that uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about race and ethnic studies like that is often how people might approach even the curriculum. Uh, but this is not the way in which uh, folks are like talking about this in this space. Um, and so I wanted to just highlight a few things that I found um, as cross cutting in terms of uh, trends and um, themes that all mentioned, but I would love to hear you all and your reflections also on one, what trends and patterns you think um, you're hearing across presentations as well as communities, and then also what challenges you, um, you hear. Um, so trends, patterns, challenges, but also ways in which people are sort of fighting against that together. Um, so some of the things that, some of the trends that I heard was, or patterns that I heard was, one is that many of the communities and the reasons why these communities are in Boston are because of the project of US Imperial, the, the US Imperial project, 
right? So many of you have um, talked about sort of like the role of um, the role of U.S. militarization, uh, military in um, other countries, talked about sort of enslavement and using labor, right? Um, exploitation of labor, um, the transcontinental railroad using the labor of people, but not necessarily wanting the full human, right? Um, the the takeover of land and imagery and the idea of even what um, uh, native means, um, and so that's one. Um, another big theme that I heard um, across uh, across presentations was about gentrification and housing. And that's really linked, I think, with some of the questions we have around whether or not folks of color are seen as full citizens or seen as full humans, right? Um, are they deserving of uh, are they deserving of, of being viewed as full legitimate humans, right? Deserving of rights um, uh, to sort of tell their own story, to have their own spaces, to have their own communities, that sort of thing. Um, and then I heard a lot of sort of intersection between race and class too, that it's not sort of this monolithic community that you're dealing with. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, spectrum in terms of what, what's happening. Um, this is really big theme actually, I heard of erasure and invisibility and the fight against that in every single presentation that um, was given. Um, and then on the flip side, um, in terms of what uh, I heard in terms of being able to combat some of those things, was many folks were talking about sort of organizing and advocacy um, in those communities to fight back against those controlling images, to fight back against some of the conditions that people live in. Um, and also the sort of like the, the real impacts it has on a family, on children, on communities today, um, right? That, that those are not just theoretical things or historical things we're dealing with, that those have uh, absolute linkages to the ways in which, um, you know, a student at BPS might face sort of uh, the hallways or might face uh, when they go home in their communities and that sort of thing. So I want to just talk, you know, have a conversation among, I'll stop talking, but those are some of the things that I heard across, um, you know, some of you might be a little nervous, like thinking about what am I presenting, but I, I wanted to just hear, say what I, what I heard. Um, I'd be curious to see, see what you heard, um, as well as sort of challenges to fight those things together and what people are doing now about them. So I'll just kind of leave it at that and allow people to, to talk through that or talk with that. I think I'll jump in to kind of kick things off and thank you, Katie, for framing it that way. Uh, when we think of indigenous people, it's a very broad term uh, and certainly encompasses people with indigenous origins both north of the U.S. nation state border as well as south. Uh, and so this leads to an immediate intersection uh, in terms of American Afro-Caribbean community. Uh, indigeneity is both housed, centered, and expressed there in different ways in this shared space of Boston. So whether I am thinking of mom Maya people who live in Jamaica Plain uh, or uh, Afro Taino people from Puerto Rico or Métis people from Canada, Mi'kmaq people, uh, all are part of diasporic populations that are here now, in addition to those indigenous communities who never left, but who became defined out of existence, if you will. Uh, particularly, I, I think back of these very early individuals who were highlighted in my dear colleagues from the Trotter uh, presentation, like Crispus Attucks, uh, like Paul Cuffey, uh, like the Native men who were part of the Massachusetts 54, intersectional stories that are all too easily forgotten or overlooked because it's complicated. Uh, and the mainstream American narrative likes simplicity. Uh, and nothing about our communities is simple. Uh, and so those are things that I see through our presentations and through our work together. Cedric, well, thank Michael, you. I mean, I want to jump in as well. So go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Hi. I, I just want to thank you, Cedric. I wanted to uh, add that one, one thing that struck me um, so much from presentations is um, and, and one thing that uh, I wish I could have emphasized uh, even more in the Trotter Institute is um, the, the the diversity of, of groups and, and nationalities um, within within all of our communities, within Latino community, Asian community, Native community. Um, 
our communities are, are multi, um, they're transnational, they're domestic born and, and immigrant. Um, there's so many different uh, uh, narratives about how we got here, who we are, um, what we're advocating for. And I'm showing my age to say that uh, when I was coming up, um, the black history that I learned at my HBCU um, told really one story. And I think these days um, it is uh, so important for um, us, the teachers and our young people who are learning from us to respect these multiple understandings of who are, we are um, in our community and to um, come to all of our different uh, community components with uh, respect and empathy. Well, to begin with Katie's original point, I think it's critical for us all to recognize that there's one thing that unites us and we're all people of color. And that's something that's sometimes not understood by the general public or even within our own populations, that shared reality. And this has an impact in terms of the economic dynamic and the political and social realities that Katie refers to from the very beginnings of the nation to the current period of time, that reality of being non-white in a particular role And that reality is something that I think we need to understand that we're that we're close and we need to work together as people of color in terms of fighting the continued remnants of the racism that is very much a part of that treatment that's been endemic since the creation of the country itself. And in terms of the four racial and ethnic institutes that you hear represented here at UMass Boston, we attempt to sort of model that understanding that we're all in some respects working together for common good and common purposes. And I think in some respects, that's that's a model that we hope to see that the city of Boston, people in the city of Boston and you students and teachers as you move forward also model the understanding that we're all fighting for simple, sim similar causes. We all need to work together. And, and while there are differences assuredly within each of our communities, and, and there are important differences that need to be addressed in some respects. There are certain elements that unite us, no matter what the, the differences might be, either within the differences within our communities and between our communities. And that's something to be stressed. And that's something I think that we're very proud here at UMass Boston to model behavior. And we want to see that it's a way to approach these issues as we move forward. Yeah. Can I oh, sorry. Please, Lorna. Oh, thank you. Because I was going to refer to you, Denise, actually. Because <laughs> um, what it really struck me as well as, you know, when we're talking about invisibility is also the invisibility of women of color, right, in these histories. Um, and so, you know, the mothers, right, all organizing, mm -hmm. mothers advocating um, for, you know, basic rights and especially for their children in our schools. And so I see that, you know, that history of bilingual education and the struggle for bilingual ed, you know, again, it was mothers, right, um, organizing um, as well, right, in, in Columbia Point. Um, so we look at these, these heroes within our own communities and where are the women, you know, there's that still, there's that invisibility um, there. And so um, I really appreciated um, across our communities that attention to you know, an intersectional analysis there and, and not erasing, right, the voices of women and the youth as well. So, thank you. And one other thing, oh, sorry, please go, Denise. No, no, please, Chris, please. Um, and this was more in response to Paul's comments about, you know, people of color as a moniker uniting us. And as I listened to the, pre uh, the presentations, I definitely noticed some similarities. Um, but what I what stood out to me, um, and I hope that as people engage with our different case studies, are the particular stereotypes that frame the experiences of the communities that we represent, right? And how they manifest themselves in uniquely or or very unique experiences and worldviews and uh, life chances. And so, as I was listening, thinking about you know the Asian American community being framed as related to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And how that manifests in violence, right? And how we think about the erasure of indigenous populations with uh, caricatures that are demeaning, 
and how that represents another form of violence. And so I think what really stands out to me is just the power of language and rhetoric, right? And how all of the communities we're interfacing with and, uh, and representing are shaped by rhetoric and uh, that make these sort of stories that are lost, but also the violence that shapes the experiences of these communities of Boston. Um, and so I just wanted to add that in as a sort of, um, to, to think about how people of color unites us, but also uh, even under that moniker, there are certain distinctions that deserve a particular specificity. And I think looking at our case studies together, it'll uh, create a rich portrait um, for students in Boston public schools. So thank you. Wow, I just want to connect with so much of what has been said. Um, but I, I think, you know, I grew up, I, I started as I was listening to um, the different presentations. I remember and how I grew up in New York City and learning from the moment that I could eat outside of my home how to embrace the interdependence of the stories of different communities. Um, and I sort of thought everybody was growing up like that. Um, when Harlem Hospital was threatened to be closed, for example, the Latino community and the Black community joined forces to advocate for funding to keep things uh, open and available to uh, the variety of Spanish Harlem and Black Harlem um, um, th th that families needed um, in terms of health. And so like I had grown up with these models of how communities work together um, for the best interest of all, all involved. And like, I'm so, so honored to be a scholarly citizen advocate and activist. Um, through this work that is very, very unique to UMass Boston. I don't think I'll, I mean, I just don't know any place else that does the kind of stuff that we do that really walks the talk and the research. And one of the things that Katie, you forced us to do or you know, forced me to do was to get um, student voices around um, at least the the case study that we um, in the Trotter Institute put together. And that was so dynamic and deep and rich. And these are eighth and ninth grade and 11th grade students who get it. They are not just thirsty, they are hungry for the content that we each provide. And because I think it's through this content that they can begin to break down those barriers that exist amongst and between communities. And it's after seeing models that what we um, can provide, that they can uh, work together and that their families can work together. I mean, you know, this really is revolutionary, I think, um, even in terms of one thing that they said in the middle end is the ethnic studies frameworks. And I think that maybe a part of our uh, conversation is based on just how critically important as organizing principles those frameworks are to provide the lens from which we can then hear each and every story and make a difference in what we do in our lives. So thank you, Katie, for making us do that. Yeah, I think uh, maybe just at this point, just uh, to kind of um, pose a couple more questions. One, I think um, Lorna is also mentioning, I'm very curious about sort of contemporary examples of solidarity. How are, how are folks working together to sort of combat these things? We know that, you know, the project of white supremacy, the project of U.S. empire is to conquer and divide. To say like, my story is unique, it has nothing to do with you, right? my story is my story and we are the most oppressed of all the other groups and we're just not gonna listen to. But some of the things that Christian was saying is like how that ideology of the controlling images of each of these groups are play against each other in order to make sort of white supremacy and the, the project of US empire hold, 
right? As the, as the structure, right? So I'm curious to hear like, what are the um, examples you've seen in the community, right? Um, historically, but also very interesting in contemporary wise that you see sort of cross communities that's happening. Um, and also just to throw in there, um, what, given the, the talks that we're having, so the realizations and the revelations we're having, I'm curious to hear what you all think are the implications of that information discussion on the teaching, of, on teaching students in DPS. And some of you are starting to get into that. Denise, you were starting to get into that. Yeah, um, if I could jump in, because I, I wanted to make sure that folks knew about an amazing um, coalition that's called the Equity Now and Beyond Coalition that is led by the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing, ACEDON, the African Community of Economic Development of New England, um, the Haitians United, um, there's, there's, there's several groups, um, there's Agencia Alpha, so it's really all the different like ethnic, you know, cultural, linguistic groups, and they came together um, to really address COVID, right, what was happening with COVID, but it's become much more than that, that's why Equity Now and Beyond, if you just Google that and see a video, it's fantastic because it's led by youth too. Um, because the youth were also like being the organizers um, and doing COVID vaccine um, outreach. And, and so I really gained a lot of inspiration too because they're, they're also using um, popular education approaches, right? In, in terms of consciousness raising, they're you know, doing grassroots leadership training in, in heritage languages. Um, and so I think that, that that is a great example. The Youth Ubuntu project used uh, was at the Margarita Moniz Academy with the Henderson School, and it was Somali and Latinx youth that were organizing around you know, school climate issues and the xenophobia and what was, you know, how they felt they were being, they were being discriminated against. And they did research to document that across, right, in solidarity, right, these youth. Um, so I see there's a lot of potential in our city um, with, you know, organizations, particularly, you know, like immigrant organizations that have been doing really great uh, solidarity work. So I just wanted to highlight that as an example. Cedric, would you like to speak to the example that you put in the chat? Absolutely. Two examples that come up, uh, the mass indigenous legislative agenda, all of that's a relatively recent term. Uh, the work that has been done with that goes back 30 years, all the way back to the partnership between uh, Representative Byron Rushy uh, and John Peters Sr., who was the first executive director for the Mass Commission on Indian Affairs, uh, and who was also the medicine man for the Wampanoag Nation, uh, calling out the caricature and racist interpretation of what the seal has meant at different points in time. So even though some of the worst language has been removed, it used to actually say in Latin, come over and help us, uh, i.e. Uh, native peoples encouraging English and other colonizers to come and bring Christianity and all these wonderful things of, of European civilizations, even though that was taken uh, away from it, it still remains something that froze native peoples into the past uh, and also was a standing threat to indigenous safety and existence in indigenous homelands. Uh, the other example I gave is uh, Nika Elagardo is one of the, the prime movers as far as the house is concerned in representing and pushing uh, the indigenous legislative agenda, particularly the, the anti-mascot bill, she and Tammy uh, Govay or Gavoya, I can never pronounce her last name correctly, um, are uh, very uh, much partners with the mass indigenous legislative agenda uh, in moving that work forward. Uh, and great partners in the city uh, across the uh, demographics from our very diverse and wonderful city council uh, to push for the recognition uh, and systemization of Indigenous Peoples Day uh, 
versus Columbus Day, uh, and pulling in and centering Native voices to think about how do we represent and tell Indigenous stories in these spaces. Well, can I say as a political science professor who's been watching the political scene in Boston for almost 50 years, that this transformation in the political reality of Boston is an important one, that we've seen leadership of color emerging with, across the board in the city of Boston. And we hope to see it continue. And it's made a difference in terms of how the city is governed and how people perceive these issues of racism and the attempt to the desire, at least, to try to confront these issues. Maybe not the ability, the simple ability, to snap one fingers and get get results, but attempt to really try to pursue an agenda that recognizes the legacy of racism and attempts to try to recognize the need to address these issues. And I think that that's a, something to be uh, con, con, uh, congratulated in some respects. And the other thing is this whole effort of curriculum development that Boston Public Schools and we are happy to be a part of. You know, we're talking about developing a curriculum and case studies that doesn't talk about a single person it doesn't talk about Paul Revere or John Adams or, or John Hancock or Ben Franklin or any of these figures. It doesn't talk about anything that's on the Freedom Trail as a critical site. Not to say that all that isn't important, but the notion that every kid in Boston believes that that's the history of the country. That's the history of race and that's the history of the political and, and, and critical history of Boston and the country and rip them know that the places that they walk and, and see every day as students and as teachers who teach in the city of Boston, there's as much history in Chinatown or in Villa Victoria or on Deer Island or in Roxbury as there is on, on Beacon Hill and in, and in all those areas. And that's the understanding that we want to have. That people, that the history of Boston is not the history only of the great ones and the, the well-known ones and the people who make the history books. They're largely written to sort of, to sort of maintain the notion of leadership and power as it, as it once was, but to understand that there is another history, an alternative history, a people's history to, to use a Howard Zinn kind of a term, that there's a people history to understand what's going on in the city of Boston, and they're a part of it. And as someone who, uh, who studied the history that all these kids in Boston study as their, their own history, we studied Boston history too. We studied who Paul Revere was and Johnny Tremaine and all that sort of stuff when I was a kid. And we should understand that this is the history, not just of Boston, but the nation that you're talking about here. <clears throat> and we can learn from this example and this, and this effort to try to develop a curriculum that goes beyond the Freedom Trail and beyond the red line, the, the, the red markers in the, in, the, in the payment, and really talks about Boston as something that is endemic to areas that you're talking about. So when we talk about the history of the country, we want to talk about things like the, 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 the what's happening on Columbia Point is critical, a Deer Island, that's what happened in Villa Victoria, so it's happening in Boston, Chinatown, and Fields Corner, and so forth. These are part of America's history, and they're part of our history, and it's an ignored part, and it's part that's relevant to them, and we hope that people understand this desire on our part to center them and their experience. I'd like to follow up, Paul, because um, amen. <laughs> you know, it's just so so well said. But you know, a part of uh, Katie's question had to do with pedagogy, and we have such little time left that there were just a couple of things that you know I think are important to 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 articulate here. And the first is that Christian framed this early on in the um, rolling out of our case study that we hope teachers take an inquiry-based stance in their uh, understanding and in their investigation of, I would dare say, not just our case study, but all of our work, that they, they understand that um, you can't simply um, uh, open up children's students' heads and fill them with knowledge and ask them to regurgitate you know, this information, but rather that students are ready to make meaning with all that we have. They are coming with lived experiences. They're coming with stories and narratives from and, and lived experiences from their own communities that must be recognized in the classroom, in their learning and teaching experience. So that I'm hoping that 
teachers will also then allow students to take an inquiry-based stance around, um, around this information and to allow for vulnerability. I mean, you know, everything's not going to be just, everybody's going to feel good to allow for space, safe space to explore some of these, when I said sometimes painful and sometimes joy, we can't forget the joy. Um, there was so much joy at the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Lorna was a major part of. I grew up attending the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York and it's slowly being inclusive, I think, in all of the parades here in, in Boston. But there was a lot of joy last, last week and that, I hope students, I hope teachers practice an ethic of care uh, with, with and love for their students um, and not simply as their professional role to, um, to impart information. So to create that space for investigation to include and honor not only the students, but their families. What I'm finding is that through, the, through our case study, the grandparents, and parents who came to just meet us to find out, what are you doing? Hey, I'm interested in this. I want to learn about so-and-so. Is there room in the grant to, a, a, you know, to incorporate families and parents and communities that teachers must really feel comfortable and confident in exploring the communities in which their schools exist? You can't just go there, park your car, go in, teach, leave at two o'clock, and go out to your your your, your home community. That's that's not enough. Thank you. I'd like to uh, follow Denise's comments, if I could, with with this reflection that um, a lot of our case studies um, are attempts to uh, revisit um, or or to to clarify or add to the historical record. So historical knowledge is, is so important for um, our students, but I want to make sure that they understand that there is a, a, a strong connection between history and action in the present and advocacy, but not only advocacy and action, but, but practice. It's, 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 it's policymakers and planners um, and transportation engineers, and all sorts of professionals who've made the decisions that have resulted in the community we have around us. And I hope that our students see that um, their deeper understanding of history can help them decide how they wish to uh, make a difference and practice after they leave school. Thanks so, so much for that, Michael. I think that's a great summary of sort of where we're, we're hoping the curriculum and just the partnership lands in terms of um, where we want students to really think about, right? I'm just gonna end with sort of like this, this question that a colleague of mine asked, which is, or, or talks about in terms of race and ethnic studies and how you approach it, which is very pedagogical, which is, you know, it's not so much that we need to fill in the gaps, although those that need, that needs to be done, right? The historical gaps and the rewritten of, rewriting of history and the counter narratives, those are all very important. But it's much more critical to ask the question, why were they invisible and why were they not there in the first place, right? So uh, um, this friend in Holyoke, uh, this colleague in Holyoke, Joel Arce, asked that question. And um, it really is fundamentally a question about power, right? Um, and the power structures that we all live in. And if that's the case, then that poses sort of the same question that Michael has at the end, which is, what do we do about it? Right? What, what can people do about it in their everyday lives and their um, in the current reality that we face? Right? What does that mean about us reaching across racial lines? What does that mean ab about us um, uh, imagining an alternative together, right? another world together? So um, I just wanna just sort of end with that. Um, we're really excited to have sort of a discussion um, a little bit later on in the month with um, teachers as well. Um, and so that will be sort of a continuation of this discussion. Um, but I'm so glad that we have this recorded for um, <laughs> for the future. So thank you so much for participating in this. Um, we're very excited just to have it recorded, have it down, um, and uh, very excited to keep working with you in the future. It's far better.
a grin for the police help me learn it help me assist in keeping it from burning don't let me quit and flee from working for a worthy purpose enlighten me and help me comprehend effects of my service i need a spark in my desire from something high pride a negative reminder is killing my stride sometimes i'm the type that likes getting results overnight without sweating or stressing overnight so i pray creator give me strength then i can move on creator show us love so we can spread around communicate with us from above hear me now my prayers in a song i speak a mouth